So if you had a client and you're going to be working with somebody in a lab, and maybe that lab is going to be um, an exercise physiology lab, it could be the case that you have them do the Bruce treadmill protocol, or that you have your client do a, um, a Queens College step test or some type of submax or maximal graded exercise test. Well, if that's the case, we want to make sure that they are healthy enough to be doing this in the first place. We want to make sure that they're not going to have a heart attack or anything like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to give a wellness or lifestyle questionnaire. But first, what you're going to do is you're going to give them this, this par Q. I want to make this full screen if I can. Nice. So one of the things that I would do with each one of these, uh, these questionnaires or these little uh, um, lab write-ups or these lab assignment pages, what I would do is I would print them out and make a little um, folder, a binder. So not only do you go to your client with a foam roller and a bungee and you know the exchange document and all these little tools, but now you have a lifestyle evaluation questionnaire. All right, I would take a look at this. I want you to fill this out. Print this out, fill it out, go through this. It's gonna give you a rating. And that rating is gonna tell you whether or not you're excellent, good or need improvement in terms of your, your wellness. Now there's a number of different aspects of wellness. There's physical wellness but there's also nutritional wellness, dependency wellness, stress management wellness, emotional wellness, right? There's different kinds of wellness. And this is a way to, I guess, get an understanding of whether or not you, your, yourself can start, I guess, quantitizing, you know, putting into some type of value or number or measuring, measuring your wellness. So this is a pretty interesting tool. For me, it's one of the things that made me change my lifestyle. All right, change what I was eating. And I know that there's other parts of this that I can continue to work on, right? But when I first taught this class, I was down here in the needs improvement, you know? So I quit drinking, started eating better food, maybe exercise a little bit, you know? And then go to synagogue and start to have a little bit of like, you know, spiritual wellness, you know, things like that, so. This is a good resource for you. But before you do that at all, you're gonna give your client a physical activity readiness questionnaire. Now, in the beginning of the lab, you're gonna to have to have somebody do or sit for a little while so that they can um, be at resting state. So they come into the lab and what you're gonna do is have them sit. And when they're sitting, they can do all of this paperwork. It's kind of a good um, distraction. So they're sitting doing paperwork, but really what you're doing is you're having them get to resting state. So they do this physical activity readiness questionnaire. Are you ready to do physical activity? And what is the physical activity readiness questionnaire? Well, it's this questionnaire that has these seven questions that are related to heart condition and cardiovascular fitness. Has your doctor ever said that you have a heart condition and that you should only do physical activity recommended by a doctor? If yes, or rather if yes to any of the questions, you cannot let this person do physical activity in your lab. All right. If they answer yes to any of these questions, and let's go over the questions. Do you feel pain in your chest when you do physical activity? 
In the past month, have you had chest pain when you were not doing physical activity? Do you lose your balance because of dizziness or do you ever lose uh, consciousness? Do you have a bone or a joint problem? It could be made worse by a change in your physical activity. Is your doctor currently prescribing drugs for your blood pressure or heart condition? Or do you know of any other reason why you should not do physical activity? If yes, don't let this person do physical activity. If yes, they got to go to their doctor. And when they get to their doctor, they're going to have to fill out another form. And I don't have this one right here, but it's called a PAR, like a physical activity readiness questionnaire. A PAR MedEx. The doctor will give you one of these. It's like a similar questionnaire. And then you might be able to do any activity you want. If you answered no to all of those questions, and we'll talk about this later, then you're able to continue with doing your physical activity. So if we're in, um, if we're in class, the very first thing that I would have done when you walked in the first day is on each of your desks, there would have been a physical activity readiness questionnaire. All right, then you're going to have to sign it and date it. All right, and this is important because of consent purposes, but also, you know, liability and legality purposes. All right, so now you have your medical history, I mean, your, your wellness check. And you already have your physical activity readiness questionnaire. Now they've been sitting for about, you know, five, 10 minutes or so. You're gonna give a health history questionnaire. All right, it's gonna be a little bit more detailed than the PAR medics or PAR, the, the PAR Q, all right? But again, these are good resources for you to have if you're a, you know, a beginning exercise physiologist, or if you're going to be doing things at, you know, as a personal trainer and you're going, you know, house to house or something and working with people. So you want to keep these things. All right. And then you have your resting heart rate and blood pressure lab. All right, so let's do this. Let's do this. Let's. Uh, I'm going to open up Microsoft Word, so I have a clear screen in the back. And we're going to talk a little bit about writing. Writing is fun, especially, especially if you have a way to do it. If you don't have a way to write, then it becomes very tedious because you sit there and you don't like know where to begin, you get writer's block. Well, not necessarily everybody, but it could be the case. So you have to have a, a place to start. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how to do a lab write-up, and then we'll go back and look at your heart rate lab, and hopefully it'll be a little bit easier to understand how to do your, your, your lab papers. And then what we gotta do is just kind of repeat the process over and over and over. I'm going to split the screen just so I have a little bit more room. I'm just going to label over here. I'm going to label the intro. Now, I want you to follow this format when you go to write, especially a lab write-up. We're going to start with what should be in the introduction. Literally, I'm going to tell you the first three lines should be written like this. The next three lines should be written like this. The next three lines should be written like this. And then when you go to write, don't come up with your own plan. Just use this plan. And if you look like when you have a published article in a journal, which if you go to grad school like Tatiana is going to go to, if you go to grad school and you have to read journal articles, 
all journal articles are going to be written like this. They don't necessarily tell you that, but this is what all of the editors and all of the all of the papers are looking for. Because if you have 5,000 papers to read, I don't want to look and try to find where in the introduction the hypothesis is. I want to know where it is. So when you write with this particular format, then you kind of conform to the way that all other writing is done. And then all of a sudden you can get through information quickly because you know where the information is going to be. And it makes it so that you don't have to struggle with trying to figure out how to write. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to do a background. In the introduction, the very, very first three sentences, four sentences are going to be a background, background statements. All right. So I would like everybody to just think of one sentence. All right. One sentence and write it down. One sentence that would, you would use to do an introduction to do to your heart rate lab that you're working on. And let's see if we can write the heart rate lab right up today. And everybody can literally just copy all of these words, all right? And then you'll be done with your first assignment. And then for the rest of the semester, we just gotta get better at doing this process. So the background is gonna be three to five statements, three to five sentences. You guys, I don't mind three. Three is fun. We're just learning. And they're going to be very general, broad statements about your topic. And maybe we could even say like something like this. Not only is our paper about heart rate, but it's about reducing heart rate. Reducing heart rate with exercise. With exercise. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to come up with very, very, very general statements about heart rate and exercise. So I want you guys to think about for one minute, just a very general sentence that you would say about heart rate and exercise. All right, one, two, three, go. One sentence. Um, heart rate is one of the most common vital signs used to indicate the health of a human body. So beautiful, right? So let me even try this. I've never tried this before. Let's try this. I don't know if this is going to work, but let's try it. All right, so go for it. Say that one more time. Heart rate is one of the most common vital signs used to indicate the health of the human body. Yep. All right. Now I need another sentence. Very, very, um, uh, very um, general about maybe heart rate and exercise. Somebody else spit one out. I said exercise is important is important to obtain a healthy lifestyle that can lead to a healthy heart rate. Great, great, great. So what she did is hold on. Exercise is important um, in establishing a healthy lifestyle. Is that enough? Now I think that heart rate is a common vital sign used to indicate the health of the human body. All right. I think what we do is we go like this. Exercise is important in establishing a healthy lifestyle. So that's what we're talking about. And how do you measure that? Well, you measure that by looking at heart rate. All right, so let's put the exercise sentence first. All right, so now we have two sentences. Exercise is important in establishing a healthy lifestyle. Heart rate is a common vital sign used to indicate the health of the human body, okay? One more sentence about heart rate and exercise.
Anybody have any uh, any idea? One more sentence. Could we say that um, if we are able to decrease our general heart rate, then we will be able to save our heart a couple beats per minute over a lifetime. The wording isn't great. We'll work on the wording, okay? So, but I'm gonna go like this for right now, okay? All right, now I would say that yes, but I think that that's almost the purpose of the state of this whole art, the whole paper that we're doing. So we don't wanna save, we don't wanna waste the, the purpose statement for now, all right? Meaning what we wanna do here is we wanna say exercise is important. Here's how to measure it, okay? And what is gonna be the result of the measurement, okay? The result is going to be something like um, um, a well-trained individual will have a what? A well-trained individual will have a what? Lower heart rate during physical activity. Perfect. All right, so now what we have is we have these three general statements. And let me see if I can go like this. This should do it, format, yep, format. Should be able to go like this, format, font, smaller. All right, um, all right, so I should be able to do that, okay? Exercise is important, and let's also do this. My, my, oh, mouse, mouse, no. All right, well, so right now we have our first three background statements. You take the title. The title of the work that you're using is, or working on, has to do with heart rate and exercise. So what you do is you define heart rate and you define exercise in your first three, three sentences, pretty much. All right, now you have your background statement. Now what you need to do is you need to come up with a problem statement, okay? A problem statement. Or let's let's switch that, let's do that, undo. Let's do this. You wanna do a impact statement. Okay, the impact statement, okay? What we wanna do is we wanna tell how, how important is this exercise and heart rate thing here, all right? A well-trained individual will have a lower heart rate during physical activity, all right? And what we wanna do is we wanna say what how many people have you know, um, um, problems or what is the impact of cardiovascular disease in the country? For instance, if the impact is this, right? Let me make this font a little higher. If the impact is this, right? If this is the impact statement, right? No one dies of heart disease. Then why are we even doing this assessment in the first place? Or if here's another impact statement, I don't even know if I can erase these. Oh, I can, I still think I can erase it like this. Let's say the impact statement is this, right? Um, Heart rate and exercise are not related. You know, like, then why are we doing this assignment in the first place? But if the impact statement is that, um, 
Um, evidence suggests that 100% of all cardiovascular disease can be thwarted with a healthy nutrition and lifestyle that includes exercise. Well, what do you think about that impact statement? What do you think about the impact of that statement? Does it now bring credence or a need for us to be doing this particular work in the first place? Right? Exercise is important. Here's how to measure it. A well-trained individual is going to have a lower heart rate. And evidence suggests that if I just exercise, I can eliminate or we can, as a country, eliminate 100% of all cardiovascular disease. That, that's a pretty powerful impact of exercise, I would, I would bet. Does that make any sense there? Right, so if I can take evidence suggests, here, let's move this back over to the impact statement here. All right, now I wish I could erase this, but I don't know if I can. Yeah, I didn't forget as much. Undo that, all right. So hopefully uh, you guys will be okay with me keeping that there. But now what we gotta do is make a problem statement. Maybe even this sentence right here. This sentence could maybe go up here as the last sentence up there. It's a little bit out of place right now, but I'll show you what I, what I would do with it. All right, but the problem statement. Now, what is the problem? What's the problem? All right, exercise can be used to reduce heart rate and a lower heart rate can reduce our risk of cardiovascular disease, all right? So what is our problem statement? And for us in our field of work, especially in exercise, our problem statement is almost gonna be the same every single time. Does anybody know what the problem statement regarding exercise is. Can anybody think of that? Okay, I, I should also say that one of the things that you can do with this impact statement here is you can showcase things like this. The incidence rate or the prevalence rate of a particular problem like cardiovascular disease or the amount of money that it's costing the country. Like if I said evidence suggests that 100% of all cardiovascular disease can be thwarted with healthy nutrition and lifestyle, that includes exercise, and that the country is spending $24 billion a year on health-related costs associated with cardiovascular disease, that's a big impact. Or if I said every year, this percent of the population gets um, a, a disease, or every year there's um, 400 new cases, um, you know, then all of a sudden you're using these statistics here to build an impact statement, right? If you lose $7 a year and only five 
or five one millionths of the population gets it, then the impact is not very high. But if 38% of people are gonna die from cardiovascular disease and it costs the country $24 billion, then there's a reason to be doing this research in the first place. So now we have to come up with a problem statement. And the problem statement for our field is going to be almost the same. It's going to be, you write it the same way every time. What is the problem statement? What's the problem in our country regarding exercise that we're running into? Aubrey, what's the problem? Is it that people aren't exercising? Right. 100%. But people can't exercise. They just don't have the time. All right. Or they're doing other things. Do you know what percent of the country doesn't exercise? Let's make this bigger. What percent of the country doesn't do daily physical activity? I'm not talking about exercise. I'm talking about anything. What percent of the country, according to, to surveys, according to self-report questionnaires, what percent of the country does absolutely no daily physical activity, Aubrey? I don't know. Is it like 50%? Yeah. Percent? Yeah, 50%. Isn't that a problem? So like if exercise is used to combat cardiovascular disease and like in Sweden, you know, or everybody has, you know, exercise in their regimen every day, then it's not a problem. But the problem in the United States or in some countries is that people don't do physical activity or that's hyperbolic. Some people just, some people don't, some people do, but some people don't. So that's a big problem. Right, so now what we have to do is we have to say, okay, what's the solution? Here's the background. Here's why this background is important in our, in our population. And here's the problem. So what are we going to do? What's the last sentence of the introduction going to be? I'll write it over here. It's gonna be pretty much a purpose, a general purpose statement. A general purpose statement for this particular project. So therefore we have a problem. So what are we gonna do about it? What is the purpose of the, the work? So this, it's always gonna be like this, 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 this article or this project or this lab or the purpose, the purpose of this work is to, now what is the purpose of this lab? Now, I guess, let's go like this.
Okay, so I think that's probably easy enough. Let me take this and move it up and make these words a little smaller. Okay, so the purpose of this work is to investigate the impact of how this is affected by that. Okay, so anybody gonna take a stab at that sentence? Cassie, um, what do you think? Sorry, 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 whoever that was, go for it. Um, it's me, um, heart rate is affected by exercise. Yeah, right. I would even say that let's maybe get a, even a little bit more um, precise. I think that this particular heart rate lab is saying the purpose of this work is to investigate the impact of maybe I mean, it can even the impact of exercise on resting heart rate, right? And then say decreasing. So let's go like this of how exercise or um, resting heart rate is impacted by exercise, right? And then I can take this sentence, all right? And put it back here at the, ba at the back, like the last sentence of this, all right? Decreasing general heart rate we'll be able to save our heart beating over our lifetime or by decreasing our resting heart rate, we will be able to save our heart from beating um, excessively and improve heart function. All right, so does everybody see how that worked right there? No, I didn't really, I didn't really have to sit here and think too hard. Now, if I change this to the Queens College Step Test and VO2 Max, like what would you do? The same thing, boom, three sentences. Tell me what the problem is. The problem is as, it, or the impact statement with, with Queens College Step Test and, cardi and, and lung disease. I mean, just change the incidence, prevalence and monetary value to how much COPD costs the country. You know, a problem statement, according to self-report, nobody exercises. Or according to self-report, you know, this many people still smoke cigarettes or according to self-report. And then the purpose of this work is to look at how our intervention here is going to impact the topic of conversation in the first place. So this is your first paragraph. Exercise is important in establishing a healthy lifestyle. Heart rate is a common vital sign used to indicate the health of the human body. A well-trained individual will have a lower heart rate during physical activity. Evidence suggests that 100% of all cardiovascular disease can be thwarted with a healthy nutrition and lifestyle that includes exercise. The purpose of this work is to investigate the impact of how resting heart rate is impacted by exercise. According to self-report, oh, sorry, according to self-report questionnaire, 50% of the country does not engage in physical activity. Decreasing our general heart rate will be able to save our heart beating over our lifetime and improve cardiovascular functioning. Right, and that's how you kind of go through it. Now, the cool thing is this, right? Let's say you're doing your dissertation and you have to, filter through like for me it was like close to a thousand two thousand articles right easy now if you have if you have on your desk a hundred articles to read and your advisor says i want you to give me the impact statement and find the article that has the greatest impact statement or i want you to find the purpose statement of each of these articles and find the purpose statement that best aligns with our research. All right, where would you look? If there was no technique for writing, where would you look? Right, if nobody wrote the same way, where would you look to find that information? It would be difficult. 
But Lindsay, if I asked you to find a problem statement or a purpose statement, let's go a purpose statement for a particular article, a general purpose statement for an article, where would you look? In the introduction. Right, but would you, would you have to read the whole introduction? You could look towards the end and it would probably be there. Always, last sentence, first paragraph. Always. And if you start like kind of looking at the format of how journal articles are written, always. So to me, as I started writing, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a prolific writer. I've been published a couple of times, whatever, but I started to realize, well, if other people are writing in this form and that form is getting published, well, write in that form and you'll probably get published. That's why you have scripts, right? Scripts for movies follow that. You have, you know, one third, the, the beginning of the movie, the middle of the movie, the end of the movie, and you have particular writing and that you have to formatting and stuff. So what it does is it helps the reader, especially if they're reading huge volume, to be able to anticipate where information is. All right, so this is a helpful way for you to not have writer's block but for also the writer to uh, the reader to improve the efficiency of what they're reading. All right, so this is how you're gonna write the first paragraph. Now, paragraph two, you're gonna have like three to five paragraphs. All right, paragraph two is gonna take the background and it's gonna expand the background. So you have a couple of different sentences, all right? You have spotlight, what is spotlight? Oh boy, oh boy, deny. So you have, um, let's, oh, what, what does stamp do? Heart? Ah, uh, fun. All right, so let's go like this. Uh, Let's go green. green. So you have one sentence here. Then you have another sentence here. And then you have your last sentence here. All right, so you have your first paragraph. This is paragraph one, the whole paragraph one. Paragraph two, let's go like this. Paragraph two, all right, paragraph number two. takes this sentence, the green sentence, let's go erase. Paragraph two, ah. Explains this sentence. It's three to five sentences that explain this sentence. Why is exercise important in establishing a healthy lifestyle? Well, one of the things that you could talk about is this resting metabolic rate is equal to 500 plus 22 times your fat-free mass. Now, I'm not saying that's what you write about in everything, but as I'm thinking about this particular paper with you guys, I'm thinking that if I can relate fat-free mass and resistance training to increased resting metabolic rate and a reduction in body composition, Maybe I can positively impact cardiovascular disease 
because obesity is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So I could write about that. Okay, I could also say that exercise is important in establishing a healthy lifestyle because exercise increases muscle strength. And if I have increased strength, then I can potentially have an easier ability to perform my activities of daily living. All right, and if I have an ability to do my activities of daily living, then I have a healthier lifestyle. But here, I think we want to relate it to heart rate. So what we would do is we would talk about maybe how exercise is valuable in, especially with the chapter that we're talking about, in modulating or impacting VO2 max. And later on, we're going to be talking about VO2 max and measuring it using the Queen's College step test. So maybe what we do is we have a statement here in paragraph two that if we were talking about obesity or weight management, we showcase this knowledge. If we're talking about the elderly population and activities of daily living, we showcase this knowledge. But today's chapter or this week's chapter, we're talking about aerobic adaptations. So we might want to talk about our knowledge of VO2 max here in, chapter, in this second paragraph that's talking about how exercise is important in establishing a healthy lifestyle. All right, so paragraph two is gonna be three to five sentences long. Paragraph three. Paragraph three is gonna take the next sentence. Heart rate is a common vital sign used to indicate the health of the human body. Well, remember, we said that heart rate and VO2 max are linearly correlated, all right? And they're related to each other. And we know that VO2 max is the indicator of, sorry, VO2 max is the indicator of cardiovascular fitness that we utilize. So now we want to relate how heart rate and VO2 max are um, used together as an indicator of cardiovascular fitness. And because they're linearly correlated, we can use heart rate as our indicator. Then chapter, I mean, paragraph four is going to do the same thing. It's going to take the next sentence and it's going to discuss the next sentence. A well-trained individual will have a lower heart rate during physical activity. Okay. So now I want to know what the statistics maybe is behind that. Research suggests this. Give a little bit of research behind your claim. All right, take two articles, explain what you're talking about here. All right, so that's what your next paragraphs are gonna be. If I have four sentences here in this introduction, do four paragraphs, All right? And then the last paragraph, Paragraph five is going to be where you kind of like summarize everything. Paragraph five. Paragraph five is going to have a couple of different parts to it. So we'll just make a little couple of bullet points. It's going to finish with a very specific purpose statement. This article will look at heart rate response or resting heart rate for an individual who is 
in their third year of college. You know, a very, very specific purpose statement. This, this article will measure or will, the, the, the purpose of this article is to calculate the, um, the number of heartbeats reduced um, with reductions in resting heart rate. Right, very, very specific. This purpose statement here at the end of chapter, on um, paragraph one, this purpose statement here is very, very general. It's the umbrella statement for all of it, very general. This purpose statement, the last sentence of chapter five is anything but general. It's very specific, all right? A specific purpose, very, very specific to the actual work that you're going to see in the material methods okay and the material methods is coming up in the next paragraph so it's going to be very specific to what is going to happen in your in your work here so very specific purpose statement okay so the this paragraph here though is going to be predominated by your hypotheses so it could be the case that you have a number of hypotheses. So you would list your first hypothesis and your second. But what a hypothesis is, is a prediction. So you're going to write your hypothesis. And it's an expectation. What do you think is going to happen? So when you guys take a look at your heart rate right now in this lab, all right? hypothesis statement it's a prediction all right you're like um uh houdini and you're trying to or you're trying to predict what's going to happen as a result of your particular experiment now for this particular work we think that an individual that exercises is going to be able to reduce their heart rate and if they reduce their heart rate, there's going to be a um, reduction in the number of beats per, per year and therefore per lifetime. It's actually, this is a little bit of a hard hypothesis, right? Because we're not conducting an actual physical experiment. But let's say we do for the Queens College step test, all right? The hypothesis would be, I predict, let's, we, we do the Queen's College step test on Cassie. And I know that Cassie is a soccer player, I'm pretty sure. So if that's the case, I know that Cassie's probably a pretty healthy um, student, a pretty healthy member of the population. So my hypothesis statement would be, um, um, it is expected that in measuring the estimated VO2 max of college age students, that they fall well within normal values. Then the purpose of this work is to measure resting heart rate and conduct specific steps to calculate how many heartbeats can be saved over the course of a lifetime with a healthy lifestyle. All right, does anybody, does any, Anybody have any questions about that? Now, it could be the case that you have more than one hypothesis because you are manipulating more than one independent variable or dependent variable. So you just list your hypotheses and then give your purpose statement. All right, does everybody see what I'm talking about there? And I think what happens is if you just apply a technique to it, 
Then this is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, uh, one, two, three, let's say four, five sentences, six, seven sentences done. Then another five, that's 12 sentences. Another five, that's 17 sentences. Another five, that's 22 sentences. Another five or three or four, let's say five. That's So in 30 sentences, you should be able to get all of that done. And I'm not saying you should as like my students, I'm saying the writer of a journal article should be able to get this done in that amount of time. Now, if I wanna find the hypothesis statement and my professor says, Daniel, by the end of the day, I want you to take a look at these 50 articles and tell me which hypothesis statement is closest to our predictive statements or our predictions, where would I look for that information? Now, I no longer have to randomly open up an article and be like, what do I do now? Right? Tatiana, if I want to find the hypothesis statement of an article, where do I look? You're going to look to that fifth section where we have it um, included in all of the reports. Done. Lindsay, if my professor asks me to look at the general purpose of an article, where do I look? The last sentence of the first paragraph. Absolutely. Of the introduction. Absolutely. Right. If I want to find some background information of the second sentence of the paragraph, the first introduction paragraph, where do I look, Drew? Uh, the second paragraph? Yeah, it would be the third paragraph. It's not really important. I said the second sentence of the first paragraph, but exactly right. Now, all of a sudden, you can start to anticipate where information is going to be. And then your job as a reader of hundreds of articles gets much more e efficient. Not only that, but now I can say, for instance, take my format here. And if the Journal of American Medical Association and the Journal of Exercise Physiology, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to submit my article into a number of different publications, Right, they're all expecting the same format. I can't just write a movie however I want. People expect a particular format and you have to present things in a particular format. So this is the format for writing an article like you guys are looking to. All right, so this is the introduction. This is all the way up until the material methods. Okay, so let's talk about the material methods. All right, let me, let me erase all this stuff. Okay, so now you're done with the first part of your write, writing, and now you have to come up with the material methods. And you're going to write about exactly what it says. You're not going to write anything else except for exactly what you're saying. You're going to write what material you used. And number one, you're going to start with your participants. Age, standard deviation of age, the age range, the N, the number of, of males and females, your all of that statistics is going to come out here. Age, gender, anything like that. If you're talking about left-handedness, right-handedness, if you're talking about any of the groups, obese, not obese, blah, 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 but all of your participants, all right? Next one is all of your, um, all of your procedures, all right? Participants and procedures. So always start with participants and then go to procedures. And in procedures, the first thing that you're going to do is talk about all of your tools, all of the tools that you've used. So any of the treadmills, any of the 
Queens College step test, anything like that. Any, and you're just going to explain what you did. You're going to say what are the tools you used and what are the what are the assessments, tools and assessments. All right, and how did you run those assessments? All right. And now what I want to do is I want to be able to replicate, replicate as a reader. I want to be able to replicate. So I need to know exactly what tools that you use so I could order the same exact ones that you got. So I want to know the company that made the tools. I want to know where they are. I want to know um, everything about the tools that you used. And I want to know everything about the assessments that you did so that I can copy what you did. I can order the same parts and everything and I can replicate it. And then the last thing, uh, uh, all right, so the last thing is tools, assessments, and the last one is statistics. I wanna know what stats you used. All right, so this is how all of your material method sections should be written. You, you make, make sure you remember that the participants are the most important things. So you mention them first, and then you talk to me about the procedures. Tell me about any tools you used. Tell me about any tests that you, that you did, and tell me about the stats that you used. Don't give me any graphs. Don't give me anything like that. All right, it's very, very straightforward. So if I want to see the list of participants and how many kids, how many, how many people and what age, first paragraph material methods, done. If I want to see whether or not they used parametric or non-parametric statistics, I'm going to look directly at the last paragraph of the material methods section. Right? All of a sudden now you can anticipate where information is going to be. And in the beginning, when I had to start to review articles, it seemed like a never ending task. But after a while, you start to anticipate where information is going to be. So your participants are going to be the same thing. One healthy 18 year old female um, college age student procedures um, used um, a heart rate analysis palpated the brachial or the radial um, artery with my index finger and my middle finger for 30 seconds multiplied by two, repeated the assessment three times, took the average value, right? What assessment did you use? The assessment that we used is included in the book. It's a heart rate lab that um, that measures um, the number of beats per minute that you could save. What are the statistics? No statistics necessary. Or what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the statistics that you get and you're gonna measure them and you're gonna, you're gonna well, for, we don't have stats, but you're gonna usually, you're gonna use either some type of like, um, 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 uh, what is it? Gold standard graphs or compare your stuff to normative values. Or sometimes you're going to have to run stats like a dependent or an independent samples t-test or something like that. That's pretty much the material methods, always the same order for every article, no matter what. All right, now next is your discussion session section. All right, discussion. Sorry, is your results. And your results should only be results. Never interpret results. So your results should be tables. And graphs. And sometimes you'll see things like R value um, equals, you know, some 0.92 with uh you know an effect size of something or other and you'll see these values 27 comma 
eight or something like that. And you'll see all tables, graphs, and stats. That's it. No interpretation. Now, you don't have to have a table and a graph and then explain. It's either a table, a graph, or explain. Now, you could have multiple tables and multiple graphs, but never graph and make a table out of and explain the same information. It's one or the other. That's it. Never interpretation. Straight up results. Okay? And each of the results the, it has to have a title. It has to have, you know... Um, uh, the description of each of your uh, variables, but only only the results in terms of tables and graphs. No information aside from that. Okay, so the last one is your discussion. The discussion is going to have five different paragraphs. Chapter five, I mean, paragraph five is what are we going to do in the future? Chapter one is, I mean, paragraph one is a very brief summary of your results. Very brief. Chapter two is what could go wrong? What went wrong? Sorry, paragraph two. What went wrong? Chapter three is, dang it, paragraph three is other work. Other works. Paragraph four is what's unique. So paragraph one is a very quick summary of what you found. All right. This article found that um, reducing heart rate can save the um, a college age student 32 million heartbeats over the course of something or other. Now, for a more complicated uh, article, that summary paragraph might be longer than than others. OK, but let's get to this paragraph here. Paragraph two, what could have gone wrong? And I believe Tatiana and I worked on before these terms, internal and external validity, internal and external validity. All right. So what could have gone wrong? What could I have screwed up doing this heart rate experiment? Did I use equipment that was faulty? Do I know how to actually count heart rate? Um, do I know how to count? Did I use a metronome in order to count or did I just count in my head? Did I count the heart rate too late after the person stopped going up and down the steps? What are the mistakes that I made? What are the, the mistakes within the experiment due to the faulty material methods that could have led to problems or incorrect results. I need to make an, an, a, a, a confession statement here. What did I do wrong? How did I screw up my material and methods, all right, so that the results that I get are invalid? How did I screw up what I'm doing to make it so that the reader might look at the summary statement and say, hmm, something's fishy here. So I'm like kind of exposing all of my problems here. This is my internal validity. What went wrong with my material methods? And my external validity is, can I generalize this to the world? Is this important for other people in the world? For instance, let's say I do an assessment on, um, on heart rate and blood and, and, and reducing heart rate by reducing, uh, sorry, reducing the number of beats my heart can go by reducing heart rate. And in my material methods section, the participant section says only 
18 year old females who are between the weight of 102 and 103 pounds who currently play Sega Genesis, all right? I mean, the number of people that fall into that category is so slim that even though we don't have any internal problems in our material and methods, it's just the population that we're studying is not um, indicative, is not heterogeneous enough for us to generalize the results of the work that we're doing to the world. So the validity outside of our particular project that we're working on is not strong. Internal validity says, is the project that we're doing itself accurate because of the material methods? External validity says, can we take this information that we have and can we do anything with it in regards to explaining trends to other people and other populations? So paragraph two, you're admitting what you could have done wrong. But paragraph three is gonna compare what you've done here with other successful works. So you're gonna compare and you're gonna say, similar to this other article, our article shows this. When I compare with other established works, we get the same results. And if I get the same results as other established works, right, what does that say about my potential internal and external validity problems? All right, what does it say about the internal validity problems if I compare myself to other works and I get the same results, Jenna? Or her screen's not on. I won't call. I won't call you out. All right, Aubrey. What does it say about the results that I get, or what does it say about the internal and external validity issues I may have had if I compare with published articles and I get the same results? What does it say? It it shows that even though that there are issues, that the same results would probably be replicated if you didn't have those issues. Right, or if I'm already replicating the same results as published articles, what does it say about the potential issues that I had? That they don't really matter. Right, they didn't really necessarily kind of come out into the wash, right? So I, I make an admission what I could have done wrong, but now I say, although I could have done stuff wrong, we're very similar to other published articles out there. So most likely, all of these things that I could have done wrong didn't come out wrong. And then what you say is, now what you do is, this builds your, your credibility here. It, it hammers down this paragraph here. What it does is it serves to negate this paragraph. Then once you've established your validity here, now you can start to do this here and say, remarkable was the finding, all right? Our, our work found this that was remarkable. All right, and now what you're doing is with this statement, you're adding to the research that's out there. What our article found that was above and beyond what other works had already published was this, all right? And that could be two, three paragraphs long, I don't know. And then you're gonna say, in the future, we would like to expand on this work here, expand the research. We would like to look at other populations. We would like to work on our procedures we would like to address the material methods issues that we may have had. We'd like to do this on a grander population. We'd like to do this with different participants with the 
5G bandwidth with a more heterogeneous population and add to the research on this topic. We would like to thank so-and-so in your acknowledgments. And then you do your um, bibliography or work cited or whatever. All right, so those are the steps that you wanna take in each one of these write-ups. Now, right now it might seem a little bit daunting, but if you have no method at all, then it becomes even worse. Because then you sit down at your computer and like, I don't know what this professor wants of me. But for the rest of your life, that's how you're going to do a journal article. Might be a little bit more complicated, a little bit more complicated writing. But when you do all your work and you start taking a look at, you know, uh, research for your grad programs, this is what it's going to look like. All right. Anybody have any questions? Yes, yeah, Sydney, what's up? Um, so it should be longer than one to two pages. Like you, you said before, it should be less than one to two pages. No, I mean, so I don't think, I don't think the work that you guys need to, it needs to be very long at all. Right. So I think that your, your introduction now, Sydney, I'm also talking about, these are steps that you're taking when you're doing actual work, but this heart rate lab that you guys have is not really actual like lab work right? It's the easiest thing. You take your heart rate, you fill it into the numbers. It's good. I don't necessarily care how long this is. I'm going to look at the format though. I'm going to try to see where you're now for, for instance, the, the results page that you have, it's going to be one sentence. You know, you don't even have to do a graph. It's going to say, um, first heart rate, this, or, you know, like, Second heart rate, this third heart rate, that done. Right. The results section is you're going to tell me how many beats did you save? You could even staple the staple, the, the, the form that you have, you know? So the results is the, or the, the material methods is pretty easy too. one participant. What are the procedures? I took heart rate. If you look in the in the um, the lab manual that I gave to you, it just tells you how to do heart rate. So you're just going to do it for 30 seconds. Multiply by two is fine. Right. Paragraph one. We already just wrote all of paragraph one pretty much for you. Right. So, I mean, I think that. All, yeah, you're right. In the beginning, it seems to be like a little bit of. But no, I would say probably the whole thing. The summary is your summary is going to be like um, um, Sydney or. or um, um, the participant um, had a resting heart rate of something or other uh, of 82 beats per minute. Um, this individual was at a healthy um, cardiovascular um, heart rate status. That's pretty much the summary statement. What went wrong? Um, I could have you know, the subject might not have been rested for five minutes, but there's not too many things that are going to go wrong. And then other works, you're not going to be comparing your stuff with other works. So you can even skip that. But what was remarkable is that you're going to save yourself 32 million heartbeats. So in the future, what maybe you make like an, a statement about yourself. Therefore, in the future, I am going to continue considering my wellness and my fitness and the level of exercise that I conduct. You know, I'm not necessarily trying to read every single line and pick apart everything that you're doing. I'm trying to just give you easy lab uh, opportunities to maybe start applying it. So if one of these sections doesn't apply, skip it. But slowly but surely start to kind of notice the format. It's a recipe. If I said, hey, I want you to make banana bread. Drew, I like, I like banana bread. I like that. And I gave you all of the, the things that you need. I put them all on a table. And I said, Drew, now go make me banana bread. 
Like if you don't have a recipe, what am I going to do? It's not going to come out well. If I give you these lab write-ups and I don't give you guidance, there's no way that I can expect them to be great. I'm just throwing all the ingredients at you, but not giving you the tools to make them into something effective. I don't care if it's banana bread or chocolate chip bread. What I care is that like I'm trying to give you a recipe and then you can make any bread that you want. All right, so pay attention to the little parts and why you would need paragraph two and why you would need paragraph three, right? And then once you're able to build the credibility of your own work through your writing, how do you address internal validity and external validity problems? Because they're gonna exist. How do you address them? Through your tool of writing and organizing your paper the right way so that paragraph three is your address to your internal and external validity problems. It's the work of other people that you're using as concurrent validity or to, to validate your work through other people's work. So it's through the process of writing that your ideas are validated. All right, and if you don't write the, the, uh, an effective way, then these issues can, can continue to be like maintained throughout the course of the work. <coughs> Does anybody have any questions about all that stuff? Like, and right now, just like we were talking about last week, where a lot of the changes in resistance training aren't because your muscles are growing bigger, but it's because your brain is becoming more effective. So a lot of the changes in your own schoolwork is not necessarily because you're becoming smarter and smarter, but it's because you're going to be able to portray the information better and better. And that's why if you have no technique of writing, it seems as though like when you sit at your computer there, you got nothing. But if there is a very specific technique of writing, then you can get the timing down. You can, you can use that in this scaffolding of writing and you get better and better and better. And then your writing symphony, all right, is starting to kind of like play together. And all of these parts will start to play together. And then by the end of the semester, each of these little um, lab write-ups should be pretty reasonable. <clears throat>